Hello and welcome to the Providence College Podcast. I'm your host, Liz Kay, and I'm joined by producer Chris Judge of the class of 2005. Here at the Providence College Podcast, we bring you interesting stories from the Fryer family. This week, we're talking with John Boab, a member of the class of 1955. Boab started as a director and producer of Broadway shows, such as the Gwen Verdon Bob Fosse musical Sweet Charity, and touring productions working with stars such as Andrew Lansbury, Carol Channing, Debbie Reynolds, and Chia Rivera. Then he transitioned to television, directing sitcoms such as Benson, The Facts of Life, Full House, The Cosby Show, Who's the Boss, and Jamie Foxx Show, and television specials for Jay Leno, Johnny Carson, and Bob Hope. He received an honorary degree from Providence College in 1989 for his contributions to stage and screen. John, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. I'm glad to be here. So you had you were telling us before about your experiences at PC that set you on the road to show business. I think so. I mean, uh, when I was here, you know, the theater was uh, uh, Hawkins Hall. It was a place that we shared with the basketball team, and I can barely go to a basketball game and get the whiff of sweat from basketball players and remembering how long we had to wait in Hawkins Hall till they left so we could rehearse. And you know, it's not a theater per se, it's, it's just a stage. But we did three musicals there uh, with silly names like uh, From Here to Mars, We Couldn't Reach Eternity, and uh, Moon Glow, and, and uh, they were fun. But they were done by students, seven of us, eight of us, who uh, realized that we all love the theater. We love legit theater. We love musicals. We we grew up with South Pacific and, and uh, uh, shows of that nature, and we wanted to be part of it. We didn't know that that one of us or two of us actually would actually make a career of it, you know. But I felt that having to do with nothing, you know, with there were no women here, so we had to go to the nursing schools. We had to go to Pembroke. We had to go wherever we could to get the women, but it was uh, it was a great experience, and I think it helped me later, you know, uh, when you were given all the, the perks later and no perks here. So that's it. And did you write some musicals yourself? I wrote student? them, yes. I wrote uh, all three of them. Two of them I, co- I uh, shared writing credit, but no, I we wrote them and, and uh, directed them and produced them and hired the actors, and most of them were friends uh, in our education class who uh, wanted to be part of it. And actually, most of them were commuters, uh, which is interesting. Um, It was, you know, the commuters and the uh, people at um, Aquinas uh, it was there was a, a strange uh, dichotomy at that time, you know. Uh, we didn't always feel we belonged here. It was a strange feeling, but eventually I became a pr- friar, and and uh, but it was not it was not uh, as democratic, shall we say, as it is now. I mean, when I talk to some of the people from the Friars now and realize there are 89 of them or something like that, and we had like 20, but of course the school was small and and maybe a little snobbish at the time. Does that sound terrible? So what set you on your path to show business? Where did you go from Providence College? Um, after serving in the uh, Navy for a couple of years, I, I went to New York with $185 thinking, well, that's going to be enough for me until I get a job. Well, the jobs ended up at Macy's selling contact paper and and selling women's shoes. I was a terrific salesman. Um, And then eventually, on purely a fluke, I filled out an application at Music Corporation of America. Um, When I went there, I went there to think if they would publish the songs that I'd written here. And uh, the girl said to me, oh, no, but we hire guys like you. Uh, they would like tall guys who had a somewhat Semitic look. And uh, and uh, so I filled it out and took it and had a glass of, of tea or ice or water. I don't know. I, I really wanted to just take her out for, for a cup of coffee. And uh, six months later, my aunt called me from Jersey. I used her phone number. 
And she said, MCA's got a job for you, and I can promise you there was a lettuce leaf left in the refrigerator. That's how broke I was. And I thought, oh, my God. So I went to work at MCA in the mailroom. I didn't stay there long because they saw that I had done the theater in high school and in college from my resume. And the next thing I know, I was producing and directing what we called industrial shows. They were big shows done at 8 o'clock in the morning for um, people. We would do introduce a new Ford, introduce a new refrigerator, introduce... And every Broadway star did them, from Andrew Lansbury to Gwen, and every one of them did them because they paid obscenely well. And we would do those shows at 8 o'clock in the morning, and they were rehearsing, and they sang and danced about the product. And I thought, I don't want to do this forever, but I did it for two years. And it was great experience. And it, it got me living in New York and having an apartment. And one day I applied for a job at a... Uh, a production company, Friar Car, and they were big producers. They had done the original Anti Meme and they'd done shows with Shirley Booth and people like that. And um, and uh, so I was there for about a year, and luck came my way because in 1966, in January, we opened with Sweet Charity with Gwen and Bobby. And, um, and then um, Four months later, we did Meme with Angela Lansbury. So I thought, this is terrific. You know, you do two shows a year. I thought, it's been 60 odd years. I'm still waiting for another Broadway hit. I did a couple that did not work. Uh, but in the meantime, it gave me the opportunity to direct. And I actually went off and directed well over 100 productions in 10 years on the road, you know, with people like Debbie Reynolds. And, um, uh, all the big movie stars that whose names I knew when I filled out my f bio here, I said, the kids aren't going to know who these people are. They're not going to know Lana Turner. They're not going to know Rita Hayworth. They're not going to know Debbie Reynolds. They're not gonna, you know. But those stars, when I worked with them in the in theater, they were movie stars. They were big movie stars whose careers had sort of leveled off and maybe... You know, someone is, is, who is a big a star as Lana Turner, uh, Post Manoa's Rings Twice and things like that. Um, she still looked breathtaking at 51. She was playing 40, but she could easily play 40. But she'd never been on a stage in her life. And so, uh, and Ann Miller, the tap dancer, uh, people like that who who had a following that you would be stunned. You, you couldn't believe that they... So they went off and we did them for uh, uh, touring companies and they were hugely successful. And uh, and I sort of got a reputation as being the good director for the women. You know, I'd like to think it was my good looks, but it wasn't. It was that I did have a, an affinity for working with them, and, but I knew them from movies. And so for me, it was a little starstruck for them, it was, oh, my God, we're working with somebody who knows how to handle us. So it, that went on for, for quite a while in theater. And then I felt that I was making a very good living, but I wasn't making the big bucks. And I wanted more than having lived on Sabin Street in Pataka, Rhode Island, you know, um, uh, when, when I first went to New York, there were four of us who got together sharing an apartment, two in one bedroom, which you had to step over the twin bed to get to the bathroom. And the whoever arrived late had the couch and a thing we called the slab that you, whoever was late, that's what you got to sleep on. You pulled it out from the couch. And I wanted that. I wanted to get rid of that image in my head. And uh, I was very conscious of it. I wanted a little better life and so and I, and I knew that television could do it but at the time I was 44 and that's not uh, and a good career but it was not an age where you go out to La La Land where they worship youth I fortunately didn't look at and they were fortunately not good at math because they would say oh my god uh, this is a Broadway 
director is a book, you know, he's directed all these things. And, and I thought, well, how old do they think I am? You know, because, but I got fortunate. And, you know, the thing of luck uh, enters into it. Um, I had an actress that I had turned down the year before for a role uh, in a stock production, mainly because the leading man uh, thought she was too old for the part. Well, a year later, she was starring in a, a sitcom uh, called Soap. And, uh, and I said to her, I hate that director. And she said, why? I said, because he's done everything I would want to direct, you know, and, and Mary Tyler Moore and all those shows. And she said, well, if you ever want to work with them, uh, you know, observe. That was a term, by the way, that we used. You observed other directors and... and um, uh, and hoped that along the way you would pick up a show that somebody would recommend. It was the only way to learn, to learn cameras. You got to understand I did not go to film school. Um, but, uh, but because we, uh, most theater is done with a, with a, uh, uh, a proscenium arch. So, you know, the, the actors are behind a line, so to speak. Uh, same thing of going to the theater. You very seldom go to the theater in the round. So, uh, proscenium arch was the same way that sitcoms were shot. To do a sitcom, uh, they were done, the term used to be three camera. They eventually became four camera in times I used five cameras. And so you were shooting simultaneously. It wasn't like doing film. Film was one camera. The lighting was different. Everything was different. But four camera was like doing theater for me. So when I went in and observed with Jay Sandridge, who was the director and the dean of those directors, uh, took a liking to me. He, and so he said to me, you can't watch from back there. You gotta come on by me on the, you know, and we'll walk the stage and stay. So with me walking next to the director, the stars thought, well, he's gonna be important. And, you know, and I, so I did learn a lot, but, a year later, less than a year maybe, uh, Jay was going off to do a pilot, and he said, well, let John direct the next episode, and that's how I got my job. And on the basis of Soap, which was a big show at the time, other shows came my way, and then another show, and then another show, and, and eventually I ended up doing 450 half hours and maybe 20 specials, and, and uh, but like a lot of people, I think in all areas I never had the career I wanted in my own mind you know we all want what somebody else has and I thought I want to have that and and uh, but I worked I worked steadily and uh, uh, you make enough money that you can go back to your alma mater and build a theater and make some uh, gifts and uh, that made me feel good. It still does. I felt so, I have such a love for this school. You know, I really have. I just, uh, uh, I credit it. I mean, when I, I tell you the truth, I was not coming here originally, but uh, I was going to uh, school, uh, Rhode Island College of Education, because I was an education major. And uh, I'd had an offer for a scholarship for, to Brown, but it was a half a year. And I, I knew I couldn't, have, and then, to, I hate to tell you, and I had to, for the students to know, tuition at Brown was probably around six fifty, seven hundred for the year, but I couldn't come up with the additional three fifty. I was a lifeguard, but you didn't make the money. It was, you know, and I sold women's shoes, and I did whatever I could, but yeah, I sold them even in high school. And so I, um, I, I lucked out that I uh, was able to um, adjust to the to the medium and the medium to me and uh, but you know there were shows that you know I was sure I was going to get Golden Girls when Jay left it I wanted that show so badly and something happened I'll never know you know and I, I couldn't pinpoint why but I didn't get it and uh, so things like that, you think, oh, God, I should have. But then at the same time that I lost Golden Girls, I got Cosby. And so that was a big deal at the time. 
you know. And uh, so, and, and I did probably 20, 22 episodes, and it was it was good. And meanwhile, I got another series that the four girls and, and Mrs. Garrett loved me, and women, years later, say, oh, my God, I loved it. It was the facts of life. And I was told, you can't stay with that show. It's not a prestige show. You've got to get away from it. But because... The girls really, I had a wonderful relationship with them. And it was hard for me to say no. And it was particularly hard when I didn't get a raise and I switched my agent and he got me an incredible raise. And and then you're doomed because now you're making the money, you know, and you're thinking, well, yeah, I could leave it, but maybe I'll give it another six months. And then six months turns into five years, and uh, but it was worth it. I mean, I enjoyed doing that show, and I know as a female, you probably watched it. I mean, I don't know a girl, woman in the world that I've met in the states who hasn't said, "Oh my God!" You know, I was, I, you know, I've had guys tell me Nancy McKeon was the perfect, perfect woman for me. You know, and uh, and. Incredibly, she was 14 when she started. She played 16. She didn't come in in the original company. The Facts of Life is an incredible show. And when I look back on the storyline, it just was so implausible and so strange. I know. Like, you know Mrs. Garrett is is like taking care of four girls, you know, know. on her own at a, at a private boarding school in upstate New York. You know, what do you think the appeal is? What, what was it about? I think that the girls, I don't, I don't think it was ever a show that, that uh, boys were attracted to, except to look at girls that they wish they could date, you know, at least three of them. Um, and I think the women really identified that they had somebody other than their mother or an aunt or somebody they could go to. Charlotte Ray was a huge influence. I had no idea. I knew at the time, but not to the degree it was years later. When people said to me, I just kept wishing if I could have Mrs. Garrett in my life, if I could talk to her, you know, and she she really had that following for years. And uh, when she quit the show after like seven years and Cloris Leachman took over, Cloris is a sensational actress, but she was not somebody who girls would look up to and say, God, I wish I could talk to you. So... That was part of it. You must have some great stories about things that were happening behind the scenes when filming all these sitcoms. I, I think so. And one of my favorites, and this, and the students, when I told it here, uh, said, "Oh, that couldn't have happened." I said, "It did." And I'll give you. An, I had met a line producer. He was not in, involved with the creative end of it, and uh, and he and. Uh, he had to tell me one day when I had gone up for a show early in my career, he said to me, I'm sorry, John, you know, but, you know, we're not going to get the job. And I said, okay. And I went home and I wrote a letter. If we remember the day that we put pen to paper and I told the kids, it's a great thing to do. Write a note. Don't send an email saying thank you for the interview. Write a note, you know. So I wrote him a note and saying, if you hear of a, a, a new director in town who jumped off a bridge or took cyanide or uh, jumped in front of a truck uh, and you think that it might be me, it could be, but if it's not me, would you think of me for something else? Well, a year later, he, he loved it. He called me and loved the letter. A year later, he called me and said, we've got a show I think that you love, and I think they'll love you. And it was a Brian Dennehy um, show that uh, didn't succeed, but I thought at the time it would, and they, always, they were offering me 13 episodes. That was a period of my life when I didn't take a single here or a single there. So I went in, I looked at it, and I thought, well, it's good, but it could be better. And I'd like to work on it. So I told that to the line producer. He said, fine, I want you to meet the producer. And I said, okay. So I walk in, he introduces me, and he leaves the room. Producer is sitting behind a desk. And the first words he says to me, 
you know, I have trouble working with tall people. And I laughed, you know, and, I, and he said, no, I'm serious. And he got up from the table, from behind the desk, walked over to me, and he came up beneath my shoulders, and he said to me, this is not going to work out. That was the end of the meeting. <laughs> so, you know, I think that was probably the... I left that room and I thought, this did not just happen. And of course, in those days, I was wearing cowboy boots and blue jeans, and, and I had a fairly decent body, so I'd wear a T-shirt. And, and I guess the image scared the hell out of them. And, but that was one of them. Most of the experience I feel that I had were uh, excellent. Uh, there, was, there was some negatives. Um, an actress who was the star of a show who had a drug problem, and it didn't it didn't happen till like the fourteenth or fifteenth episode when, you know, she, she, up until then it was a love fest, and then so suddenly it was. Uh, I don't like what the way you're talking to me, and I thought, oh, so. But most of them were really terrific. I mean, certainly, Facts of Life always was, and Benson was, and Soap was, and. Uh, bosom Buddies was. I, I don't ever remember any that I really didn't like going into. Where you get, and I think it's worth noting, I think it applies to every job. When you begin to feel that what you're doing isn't what you really want to do anymore, that's the time to get out. And that's what happened with me. Uh, I think the worst words you can ever hear would, but along with sounding like the best words, were in your business manager. I've been with the same business manager, by the way, since 1961. Okay, so, and from your from your, tele, from your Broadway from, days. And, yes, yeah. from way back, and he handled Laurence Olivier and Bob Fosse and all big people, and they handled me when I wasn't making money, but they stayed with me. And one day. Um, my business manager took me to lunch, and he's, uh, we had a great lunch. I remember it was at the Princeton Room. He was a graduate of Princeton, a wonderful man. And um, he said to me in the middle of a conversation, you know, about me saying, you know, I'm not crazy about some of the shows I'm doing right now. And he said, you know, John, you don't have to work anymore. So I went, wow, you know, but I did. I worked for another year, year and a half. And but I then I said one year one day, you know, I think I'm gonna take a year off and my agent said, If you take a year off you're not gonna come back and I said, particular reason? He said, Two reasons. They won't want you back if you've been gone for a year. And secondly, you probably won't wanna come back yourself. And the truth is I can't tell you when I retired. I mean it was I just one day t didn't get a show, didn't ask the agent to get me a show. And uh, I stayed home and I went to museums and I went to the beach and I did whatever I wanted to do. And I I had lunch with friends and I went to plays and, I, and suddenly a year passed and, and I can't tell you when the year was. And then a second year and then a third year. And I've probably been retired for 10 years. But I could not, if I, if I were paid a million dollars, I could not tell you the year I quit. I can't pinpoint that one day. It just happened. And did you stay in touch with some of the stars from the shows? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think I, think I stayed in touch more with the people from theater. Hmm. There's, theater is more of a family than television. Uh, television, people move around quickly. Theater, if you if you're working, you you have a, a kind of contact, and also it's what I'm telling the students here: don't go running to California. You know they they're 21 years old and they're looking at the screen, they're seeing all these young people, and they're thinking I could be that, you know. But the truth is, and I told them, I said, you're older, but you're not necessarily grown up. You know, grown up is when you go live away from home you know and 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 uh and you find uh, other outlets in your life 
And uh, and I think New York is a smaller town. I said, you'd be surprised it's smaller than Providence. If you go in and you realize it's only 12 blocks across and maybe a mile and a half this way, and they look at you, I don't think they've ever thought of it. You know, uh, New York was what appealed to me because I was from Pawtucket. And uh, New York was only 180 miles away. California was 3,000 miles away. It never occurred to me to go to California when I finished school here, also because I'd written the musicals. I know that they seem silly and stupid today. They do to me sometimes, and some of the music and lyrics that we did don't seem it, but the books were silly and fun for college. But um, they told me that you can do this. You can write, you know, and you can direct. and. Uh, so I think New York looked accessible because you heard about all the writers and all the directors and all the people, and it was small. And so I'm glad that that was. And I would I would tell the students the same thing now, and I have on this trip I did. I said, don't run to California, you know. And 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 I'm sure some of them they, when they come to the Hollywood tour, and they one of the first questions is, well, how can I get an agent? And I say, learn to act. You know, I mean, if you if you're good and you're doing an off Broadway show, you'll get an agent. You know, if if you're not so good, you you won't get the show. But start with the basics. Yes, is, is what so. it comes out with. So, you've given to PC in so many ways. I mean, you've mentioned PC in Hollywood in the trip where you host students every year. Mm -hmm. um, uh, can you tell us about why you wanted to give back and and how, the many ways? You... Why well, I wanted to come back. Um, maybe uh, a little, I think when you get to be almost 86, uh, other thoughts cross your mind, you know, thoughts of uh, it's almost over, and yet you can't believe that it's almost over. And this is a way of coming back and remembering and, and knowing I also wanted to know how my money was being spent, the money that I gave them, the scholarships, and also um, how was the theater being used. I had no idea that uh, uh, the John Bullock Studio Theater was used every day. You know, I thought, well, they rehearse a show occasionally or something, and they shift the thing. They're in there every single day, you know, and it's booked all the time. Uh, and uh, then I watched a rehearsal, you know, at the David Angel Theater. Uh, and uh, David and I never worked together in uh, television. And, uh, but we knew each other, and that was just the most tragic loss. You know, he had retired. You know, he was much younger than I was. David Angel, who was the uh, creator, he worked on Frasier and some. He worked very... on Frasier. He had two other partners, Peter Lee and somebody else. I knew them all, and uh, I think something happened with David, and he just decided to retire, and he moved to Tewissit or somewhere else out here. Had a ton of money, no children, a wonderful marriage, a great marriage. They were together for years and years and years and uh, but he stayed in touch with the industry but he, I was told he had no interest in going back no interest in writing anymore and he got on an airplane and, and they were going out to, to the Emmys and that plane went into uh, one of the towers you know and you say yeah, you know it's, it's it's you know those things happen so for, for me I feel so blessed that I've had a good life, uh, you know, and as I said, maybe not the career I wanted, but certainly a career that a lot of other people would have wanted, you know. So, uh, you know, I have friends of mine who were younger uh, than I was who are struggling now, you know, they've got a wife and the kids and the mortgage and the thing, and they don't have jobs because they've uh, been phrased out. See, that was one of the things with television. You weren't always in command of your career uh, because um, 
like when I went out I, um, with Thomas, with the big producers, they did a whole slew of things, including Golden Girls and and uh, Soap and all those shows. They, did, they were successful for years. Norman Lear was successful for years, and I worked for Norman Lear. And the day Norman said to me, you know, you're a terrific director, was one of the happiest days of my life. But one day they don't have a show. So you wake up and now you're going to have to meet new people. And that's what I'm trying to tell these guys and the girls here. You don't know when your career can change, and it can quickly in television. And if you haven't put your money away, and believe me, uh, a friend of mine that I'm going to be having lunch with today used to say, you know, a BOAP can make $65 a week and save 70 You know, and it was... I always believed in putting a few bucks away, you know. Uh, I believed in shopping in, in um, the secondhand clothes, you know, and I did that. I, I was not... Now I got crazy because I ended up buying a big house with the big swimming pool and, and the whole thing. And uh, I lived in it for 13 or 14 years. I did a ton of charity things there. I did concerts with Barbara Cook and Rosemary Clooney. We did 22 concerts there. And then when I sold the house, I did I did 13 or 14 more at the Pantages Theater in the lobby of the Pantages. So I could always get those on. I knew how to do that. I knew how to contact people. I'd made good friends. Um, and when I sold the house, it was funny. I had sold the house to Drew Barrymore, and after I'd been in it 13 or 14 years, and I sold it in 2002, and I'll talk money now, it's so funny. I was so pleased with what I made. I thought, very good, you know? And uh, she sold it in August for $16.5 million. And trust me, I did not sell it anywhere near $16.5 million. But she held on to it, and... and um, she didn't use it much because she had children. She suddenly had kids. And it was a, a swimming pool that you could not put a... Fence around. Yeah, you know. And it had a bridge over it to a guest house. And it, and it had, if you went below the the um, a pool, um, there was a staircase that went down below. And it had a gun range of 75. Okay. So... Um, it was a house not for kids, but she um, she did some work on it, and um, uh, and I th I think it was you know for her a good investment for me a good investment, you know, and uh, then I bought a great place where the kids from on the Hollywood tour come, and it's got a spectacular balcony and it overlooks the city of of West Hollywood and Los Angeles and. And it's got lemon trees growing on it, and a peach tree, and a lime tree, and I get huge lemons, and the kids come in, and and it's they're doing what I did. I want to have this, and I want them to know it's it is possible. It is possible. It is not necessary, but it is possible if you dream that. And I tell them if you have the dream of wanting to be in the business, you got to follow it. When I wanted to come to New York after the service, my dad said, why would you want to do it? You've got a degree in education. You'll always have a job. That was the mentality. You'll always have a job. My mother said, go to New York. You'll be happier. So, you know. Can you tell us more about your parents? Because uh, you, you yeah, mentioned... My, my parents were terrific. My dad never made, uh, and he's long gone, but he never made a great living. My mother... And he both came from Damascus, Syria. And uh, she was a very pretty woman, my mother. She was a seamstress. And um, uh, she sewed everything. She made all my clothes till I was 14, including my trousers, my slacks, my underwear. Um, and at 14, when I grew to 6'1", um, she said, you're old enough and you're working. You buy your own clothes from now on. It was too much work. But they were Syrian immigrants, and um, uh, that's why it's tough for me to understand this mentality that I see 
I hate I'm getting political, but, but the mentality that I see in the White House um, about immigrants, you know, um, we're going to be sorry because we're going to lose a lot of talent. We're going to lose a lot of talent. You know, they're not all not all the uh, immigrants should be coming from Norway and Sweden. They don't have to be blue-eyed blondes, you know. And um, but they they came and they did what they had to do, you know. And we eventually had a three-family house. And the main reason you know, they paid six thousand dollars for it in the forties. And the main reason we had it. We lived on the first floor, and we rented the other two. It was because nobody wanted to rent a house to a family with four kids. So they did what they had to do. You know, they nobody nobody wanted kids living on the second floor. You know, we didn't, uh, to the best of my knowledge, we never had kids living up there, so maybe there was a little prejudice in my own family. But they were they were fun. Living in Pawtucket was fun. It really was. I mean, it was the... Um, the picnics and the, uh, the Slater Park and and the things that we did and we had no money but everybody else we knew had no money you know um, I remember once going to a friend's house and the curtains in the living room were lined and I thought wow I remember it clearly walking in and they because curtains and everywhere else were not they had drapes we had curtains you know so um that there's just little clues that, but they well, but like you know those are, those are things uh, that live with you, you know, and and um, you want to have them, but it's not the end of the world if you don't, you know. Uh, I think good friends, and I do have good friends. Um, many of them who were the actors I worked with, I was very close with Debbie Reynolds, particularly close with Debbie, and. Um, I did charity work for her as well as I, I did Molly Brown. She had never done it on stage. And so I had to rewrite it. I literally rewrote it because we had to take 16 or 17 minutes out of the play because she had that big number, you know. And when I when she first called me and said, I'd like you to do it, and I said, Debbie, I want to see your act again. I hadn't seen it in years. Well, I'm going to see the act, and she's doing you know, little push-ups with their hands, and I said, you can't do that. You've got competition. She said, who? And I said, yourself. They see the movie. You've got to do whatever you did in the film or don't do it. Don't do the tour. So I got to rewrite Molly Brown with the author's permission. And um, I did, I think, a great job on it. And Debbie was a big hit, but she was 59 and she learned to do everything, swinging from the chandeliers. And so our relationship was terrific. And we did a Bob Hope special together. So Debbie and I stayed close. And I did a lot of, she was very big with a group called the Thalians, which dealt with mental health. And uh, the young Hollywood actors had started when she was like 20. She was president of it then. And so I did three benefits for them. And I do a lot of benefits. I don't do as many today, but I like doing them, you know. And uh, I, so, anyway, that was it. You mentioned your theater family, but I'm wondering, you know, with all the warnings your father gave you when you were leaving Pawtucket, um, did he get to see, did your parents get to see your success? My mother didn't, know. My mother died in her 50s. But my dad, um, it's funny. He was a, a funny character. He he relished my success. He relished it. And when I had Mame running on Broadway and, and Janice Page replaced Angela Lansbury, I took up Dad up to the dressing room and he posed for a picture with, I want a picture with her, I want a picture. And she was a very pretty woman. And he got a picture, you know. The next thing I know, it's in the Pawtucket Times, you know. So... <laughs> I said to him, how did that happen? He said, well, somebody knew I had it. I didn't say anything. A couple of years later, I was directing Lana Turner in 40 Carats, and we were playing in Westport. Uh, West, uh, Port, uh, and so I took my dad to the opening and some other people, and we went to a big party afterwards. And um, my dad sat next to Lana, 
Turner, who was the star, and I and I couldn't get next to her. My dad was sitting next to her, so I sat next to my dad, you know. And next thing I know, they're taking pictures. And I said to my dad, this better not show up in the Pawtucket Times. And he said, oh, I won't, I won't, I won't do anything. Don't worry about it. Well, it, next thing I know, it showed up in the Pawtucket Times. They took a picture of the three of us. There were only two of them. He cut me out. You could see my hand. <laughs> You could see, and he had the nerve to say to me, "Well, you know, they don't like to put three people in a shot in the paper. They like two shots." And now I don't know where he heard it, but he had an excuse ready. He said, "I didn't do it." I said, "Dad, I can see my hand on your shoulder." <laughs> anyway, he did love it. He loved. Um, he didn't live to see me in television for any length of time, but he did come around to a lot of the plays. You know, uh, I did uh, I did uh, the most happy fella here in Providence for the uh, the opera company. We had a cast of a hundred, and uh, my dad came to that. He also came to the closing night of the Road Company of Mo of uh, Mame, uh, which closed here strangely in Providence. So he walked up the aisle and he looked at me and he said, "You've done better." <laughs> So, <laughs> but he was right. It was the last performance of a year-long tour, and they didn't care. They just wanted to get out, so they were rushing the lines. They would do, and as, as soon as the scenery came off or the costumes came off, they were in the boxes. And so, it was not a good thing. But I just looked at me and said, "You've done better." And it's a <laughs> it's a phrase I think of every so often. I think yes. Nothing like your parents do. Tell yeah. it like it is. But, you know, but uh, the, the fact is that they were um, immigrants who um, who joined other immigrants. There's a big Syrian population in Pawtucket at one point, as there was Irish, as there was French. Uh, not as much Italian. Italians were in Federal Hill, which we call Federal Heights. Um, but, um, but Pawtucket was a true mixture. You know, and I think it's it's probably tough for people to realize, but Central Falls, which was only one mile long, I mean one mile square mile, square, um, uh, uh, Central Falls was at one point the most populated city in the world. You know, the, because it had not three story buildings; they had the four stories. You know, and they were all put next to each other. So we were a mixture, and and. And I think so many wonderful people have come out of this area, and and but they would not have been if it had not been. Uh, I mean, and I felt it at Providence. We had uh, a lot of the people that I, you know, that I said there were problems at first. I think with uh, with me here, I almost quit the first year. I I, I think partly because I was the bright-eyed boy from high school. You know, I was Mister popularity and Mr. This and I don't know how. And I suddenly got to a school where there were hundreds of me, you know, a hundred other students, all of whom were probably good in their class, you know. So those are things that I remember and I uh, I do have good recall. I, I admit that. I can remember s stupid things and some beautiful things. But we're so grateful that you stuck with it. I did. And I'm happy to, to have done it too. John, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. This has been fantastic. Oh, well, I'm, I'm glad. Subscribe to the Providence College Podcast in all the usual places, including iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Transistor, and Spotify. If you like what you hear, please review and share with others. Thanks for listening, and go Friars.